Our speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Ben Powell. He was a senior fellow at the Independent Institute, an associate professor of economics at Suffolk University, and the president of the Association for uh, Private Enterprise Education. He received his PhD in economics from George Mason University and has been assist an assistant professor of economics at San Jose State University, a fellow with the Mercatus Center's Global Prosperity Initiative, a visiting research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. In addition, he's authored more than 50 scholarly studies and is the editor of the books Housing America and Making R uh, Poor Nations Rich. With that, please welcome Dr. Powell. All right. Thank you, Kyle. All right. Well, I'm pleased to be here. In, in addition to being a senior fellow with the Independent Institute, I used to actually direct a research center, so I was up here two days a week, so it's nice to be back here in the offices. And I used to lecture to the summer seminars um, then when I ran the center, too. Uh, so my topic today is globalization and development. Originally, it was just going to be development, and then they told me they wanted to cover globalization, too, which works kind of well given the topic of a couple of the lectures I'm giving you later today, I guess, and tomorrow, of sweatshops and immigration are all aspects of globalization, but more controversial aspects. So it seems like we should start with a little bit about trade and globalization generally. Um, and I apologize, since I wasn't here earlier, you might have already been asked these type of questions, but I just want to get a feel for, for you guys and where you're at. How many of you have any sort of background in economics at all? A third of you, maybe, or so. OK, and then a sh shaking hand one. All right. So let's just start with trade. Actually, before we even start with trade, since this is and development, it's worth pausing for a moment and thinking about, we, to see his current political phrase, we are the 1%. In fact, the much less than 1%. The history of the world is one of poverty, disease, famine, early death. That's the history for most of mankind's time and across most sections of the planet at any given time. It's only about 300 years ago that that started changing in a pocket in Western Europe and has since spread to other areas of the world. So sometimes when we look at poor countries today, people assume we must be doing something wrong to them, or you hear colonialism is what's made them poor. No, humanity's always been poor. We have to figure out what changed to make it right. What let the genie out of the bag that let some people finally start achieving a higher standard of living? And how is that transmitted to other parts of the world then? Or how could it be better transmitted to help other people escape the grinding poverty that is our history? Uh, but I know when I lecture with students here in the US, oftentimes people just seem to take it for granted, like, yeah, everybody should have a high standard of living. And in one sense, I think that's true. If you get your institutions right, it'll kind of occur naturally, but it's a process and it takes time. Um, but it's worth just pausing for a moment to realize that we are the exception. And now let's talk about how it might get to other places. So let's start with globalization more generally in trade before I get into development. Why do we trade? Forget international stuff, just people. For mutual benefit, right? You give up something to me because I'm better off. I give up something to you that makes you better off. If that wasn't true, would you trade in the first place? No. 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 If I, can I offer you a penny for your pen? I can offer you. I'm offering you a penny for your pen. Would you like to trade it to me for a penny? You won't have it. So there's a cost to giving up that pen. The pen is useful to you, and it's more useful than a penny. So she rejected my trade. We wouldn't both be better off by it. Have I made her worse off in any sense? No. I just made her an offer. Didn't make her better off, so she didn't engage it. What's that? She took a bit of her time, but, you know. Yeah, I took a bit of all of your time, but your time is mine right now anyway. <laughs> How about a dollar? Can I buy your pen for a dollar? All right. Cool. Now it became mutually beneficial. She got the dollar, kind of ripped one. And I get a pen. She might have another one. I don't know. Apparently, taking notes on my lecture was worth less than a dollar to her. <laughs> <laughs> I know where I'm worth. Um, but uh, and she got a backup. Uh, so this is why we engage in trade all the time. Because you make someone an offer that makes them better off. They make an offer to you that makes you better off. Somehow, we get weird about that when we start drawing lines on maps, or lines politicians draw on maps. What's your name? Beata. Beata? Beata. Beata. Beata and I are here in this room in Oakland together and meet the trade. What if there was a line right here, and she was one of those Canadians, <laughs> and I was a US person, and I made her the same offer for a dollar for the pen, and she traded with me? What's changed? Nothing. People trade. Countries don't trade. So you hear talk about trade with China, 
China doesn't trade. America doesn't trade. People in America trade with each other. People in America trade with Chinese people. But at its fundamental base, all trade is done by mutual consent of adults. That means there's gains from trade here. But somehow, what makes sense when we're sitting in Oakland, people start losing track of when it goes into the international context, whether it's trade with Canada, Mexico, or China is the popular one that you hear a lot about now. But it's important to keep in mind that it's still just the same basic exchange. So we trade for mutual benefit. Why is there mutual benefit to be had in the first place? Yeah? Because uh, um, each person wants the other thing more than um, they want the other thing that they're trading away. Absolutely. But why don't they just make it all themselves? Why don't I just go around and make pens for myself? Specialization so you don't leads have the supplies. to greater wealth. Specialization leads to greater wealth, what? You don't have the supplies. I don't have the supplies. Well, I could go like around just plastic and ink and stuff. I could go around and hunker You don't around. have the supplies to make it. I could get them. No, I mean the equipment. <laughs> the equi I could get the equipment too, <laughs> right? I mean, I could go out and I could paper mate. They're probably too big for me to buy, but conceivably, I could go buy the same machines that Papermate has, take a loan out, and like you know, manufacture my pens, right? <laughs> Why don't I do this? You're the town that's better used in your own specialization. Yeah, namely giving economics lectures to a bunch of you guys, right? <laughs> because our time is valuable. Or, put differently, there's different costs for everybody of doing different things. So the cost to me making pens is not just a monetary cost. It's what I give up to do it. Maybe learning a bunch of economics and sharing that information with the general public and my students. So it doesn't make sense for me to make pens. Instead, just, I forget, uh, you're the one who said specialization, right? Instead, it makes uh, sense for some people to specialize and make pens, other people to specialize and learn economics. Uh, so this is true when we're trading domestically and also internationally. So let me tell you, there's, let's talk about this. How do, how do we make cars in the United States? Assembly line. Assembly line. Oh, did we have like a lecture on like Henry Ford earlier or something? Or you're just like, oh, bang. Um, <laughs> so you do it on an assembly line. So roughly it goes something like this. In Detroit, they bring together a bunch of metal, some engineers, some rubber from Indonesia. There's an assembly line. They slap together the automobile. Actually, it's really fragmented production. that comes from all over the place. The engine might be assembled in Canada and then come to Detroit and then get put in there, but whatever. That goes down the assembly line, we make a car. That's one way to make a car. Cool. Everyone gets that, right? There's another technology to make cars. I don't know if you've heard of this one. It's, it's pretty cool. It's even cooler than robots, although it does involve a mystical machine. And making it every part. Well, that's one way, too. But how about this way? We could plant a seed in Iowa and grow our cars. Wow. Here's how it works. Ready? You plant the seed in Iowa. Anybody here from Iowa? OK. What do they grow, corn in Iowa? Or is it wheat? Corn mostly. corn mostly. OK, we'll make it corn. So it's corn. So the corn comes up from the seed, right? Then you chop it down. Chop down a bunch of the corn, because we need a nice car here. We stick it in a truck, and we drive it out here to Oakland. And then if you look just north of us on the docks, there's these machines with metal boxes. And we stuff all the corn in the metal box. And this machine turns corn into cars. We just kind of push it off the shore. It disappears over the horizon. <laughs> we wait three months. And then it spits out cars at us. These cars, and they say Toyota on them. Chinese cars. That's Japanese, Japanese cars. That's, <laughs> but forget Japanese. It's the magical, mystical box car. Forget that it comes from Japan. It's just, we just pushed the machine offshore, didn't look at it, and corn turned into cars. Pretty cool, right? So we've got these two ways to make cars. One's in the assembly line in Detroit. I'm getting there. Yeah, so I was gonna, about to ask you, and you got impatient for me, which way should we make these cars? We could do it on the assembly line in Detroit, or we could grow them in Iowa. Well, there's not a right or wrong answer of this is the way we should make them. The answer is we should do it whichever way is cheaper to make the cars for ourselves, right? What is this except international trade? So that's how we do it. It really does work. It's we could make the car ourselves, or if we're better at growing corn, we can grow the corn, send it to the Japanese people. Some Japanese people put cars together and send us cars in return. If we can get more cars by growing corn, we should do it that way. 
If we get more by doing it on the assembly line, we should do it that way. So the answer is, which is ever is cheaper. It goes back to the same reason I don't make my own pens, right? Because the cost of me making pens is greater than the cost of somebody else making the pens for me and me engaging in trade to get them. Same when it comes to cars or any other product in international trade. Give me one sec. Where if we can produce something else more cheaply that someone else values, we can get more cars by doing what we're relatively better at in the United States and swapping with what somebody else does relatively better. Yeah. I heard this one uh, humorous example of this guy in um, Britain who decided to make his own toaster, but he was going to make everything from the very basic part, from making the plastic everything. So uh, he did it, but it took him about two years, and the toaster was pretty uh, melted-ish, and it, it was not nice looking at all, and it hardly worked. Yeah, I've heard of this example, and a toaster is actually fairly complicated. There's a famous essay, I'm sure the Independent Institute has copies around here somewhere, called I Pencil. Some of you probably saw it in your various debate teams, right, of the millions of people who have to cooperate to make a simple number two pencil. That's a whole lot of trade that went on to produce that. Um, all of which people were responding to, in economic speak, we call it comparative advantage, what you're relatively better at doing. This is the fundamental force that drives trade throughout the world. Whether it's domestic trade, I saw you had a lecture on Caruso economics, I don't know if Friday got introduced, uh, but whether it's two people who are trading or millions of people across lots of different borders, the same forces do it. And what it says is when we specialize in what we're relatively better at, there's more for everybody. So the brain surgeon shouldn't be mowing his own lawn because if he frees up his time for mowing his lawn, that's more time that he can do brain surgeries. There's someone else who is contributing to brain surgeries by mowing lawns. They don't have to have all the technical skills of the doctor in the operating room. All they have to do is be able to mow his lawn better and it frees him up to use those skills more. These forces of trade are what dictate international trade flows. Um, nothing changes when we cross lines politicians draw on maps. What are some things that you hear that might change? What do people get worried about? Nobody gets worried about international trade? Yeah. People get worried, uh, well, the government gets worried that um, look, or, uh, domestic businesses want to go to other countries to conduct their manufacturing. Because it's and cheaper. And those countries, even though they themselves have institute policies that are anti-business and encourage them to go to more business friendly countries. Yeah, so I think there is something to worry about when companies want to leave the United States, but it has nothing to do with international trade. It's probably a signal of a lot of the bad institutions that we have in, going on in the United States right now. Uh, but fundamentally, businesses shifting location is part of the natural process. And we get benefit from that. It's not like, what if the business does go overseas? Do we lose our jobs? Particular people might lose jobs who worked in that business. But we don't like go and shoot the people then. What happens? They get new jobs. They get new jobs somewhere else. It might take some time. It might take some retraining. The fact that if the business, let's say there's no government policies perverting this, they just go to get cheaper labor somewhere else, what that means is the cost of using the labor here, and I don't mean the cost to the business, I mean the cost to the people working there. By them doing that job, they're giving up even more valuable things they could be making elsewhere. That's the nature of it when the business is like, I can't afford to pay these workers enough here compared to what I could pay cheaper workers somewhere else. It's telling the workers you're using here are more valuable to somebody else, so you should not use them. This, I know you got a lecture earlier from, from Greg, I think, on prices and competition. So it might be a little bit of repetitive, but this is what the price signal is showing you. The beauty of the market and coordination is the price signal tells you how valuable things are to other people. And then when you can't profitably produce with it, that signal says stop using this resource and let somebody else use it who can make, create more value. And the same is true when it comes to labor. When you can't afford to hire workers anymore, it's telling you those workers are more valuable to somebody else. Stop using them. Go find a worker who's cheaper somewhere else. Another objection. Yes? Dependency on another nation for whatever the commodity is? Dependency on the other nation. So like oil, right? That's the big one everyone's scared about. So I'm not really going to get into foreign policy too much. Let's just say a country like the United States that has two massive coastlines on opposite oceans the risk of like a blockade and not being able to trade goods is pretty minimal. <laughs> it's not like we're a little landlocked country somewhere. Um, so the idea of 
we don't want to become dependent on others because we might not be able to get the goods and services because someone will blockade us, I think is just patently silly. Um, also, and the Independent Institute did a good book on, on oil uh, a couple of years ago, I think. The idea, how about oil? Well, they might withhold their oil as a weapon. How valuable is their oil to them if they can't sell it? Just some black liquid. It's valuable for them to want to be able to sell it to us, too. Uh, I think most of the international, poli in, uh, international defense issues related to trade are just a mask for protectionism, usually. Another one. How many have heard? Record trade deficit. None of you guys have heard this? Oh, all right, this isn't even a fear then. Done. <laughs> uh, a lot of people, so I'll give you the nutshell of it and then smash it, uh, is we import more from China than they import from us. So people are always worried about our exports, making sure we send enough goods to other countries. At a fundamental level, this has got it all backwards. It is a very mercantilist view. But we do not get better off when we send our goods away. We get better off when we get goods in. So let's say, like, we went to the limit, and they were like, China is just going to make everything for, for us and give it to us for free, and they won't take any of our stuff in return. Pretty cool, right? Well, they get, they get worse off, though. They get definitely worse off. But for us, nobody worked. That's cool. We'll just take all the goods and services and use them, right? Dependency, though, this turns into dependency on whoever gets the goods. The point is, jobs are a bad. That's why people pay you to do jobs. The value, the goods and services the jobs provide, that's the good thing. So when we're importing goods, that's perfectly fine. It's not like a threat to hurt us. They don't have to extract an equal number of goods and services from us to make it beneficial. Unfortunately, Exports are the price that you have to pay to get your imports, because for the most part, other countries don't just give us their goods and services for free. They expect something in return. Yes? Why, why do you say jobs are bad? Do you like doing them? Well, I don't like doing my chores. Right. But I do like getting money for it. Exactly. So somebody values you doing your chores, and they pay you for it. You do your chores, probably for two reasons. One, the pay you get, and one, so your father doesn't give you a beating. Uh, <laughs> But <laughs> that's a little different than most economic exchange. <laughs> the job is the bad. Like, you don't like go about like, oh, my chores are fun, right? Some it's like do, though. someone values your chore enough to pay you for it. What the chore is doing is the value. You doing it is not. Like, if you could do your chores on half the time, that would be better, right? If your chores got done and you didn't have to do it at all, that would be even better. So the job is the bad part. The chore getting done is the good part. Same true of every job. Yeah. For you, getting paid is even better. Yeah. So when people say China's sending us stuff, more stuff than them, there's this one problem going on that we've mentioned. The other is we actually do have to give them something in return. So sometimes it's good in services, but when you hear a trade deficit, it means we're trading assets with them too. So they're buying stocks, bonds, land. So you still have to give something up for it. And some people will be like, well, we're selling our assets to them. Whose assets are they? Uh, our? Well, there's someone's. The person who sold it, right? Like, if your parents go and get a loan for a car and buy a car, are they worse off? No, it's gained some trade, right? They decided the car plus the interest, excuse me, the car is a better benefit than the cash they have to pay plus the interest they're going to pay on the loan. That's gains from trade. Does it matter if a Chinese person lent them the money or an American person? Still gains from trade. It's just we compartmentalize these things. That's how you hear trade deficit. In fact, actually, the mirror image of a trade deficit is a capital surplus. It just doesn't sound quite so scary in the newspapers if you hear record capital surplus. That means foreigners are investing more in the United States. But every time you hear record trade deficit, the flip side is record capital surplus. The two are uh, opposite sides of the same thing. Yeah. Going back to getting the like, loan for a car, right? Uh, they could see it as a bad trade if after the trade they regret it. But when you make the trade, you always uh, want it more. Like, yeah. So these things are always expected value going into it. And we make mistakes. This is true whether we get the loan from a Chinese person or an American person. Or when I find out this pen runs out of ink like three sentences after using it, I might have regret. 
But ex ante going in, we always think that it's beneficial. And on net, what the market does is it punishes people who repeatedly make mistakes like this, and we have every incentive to correct the behavior. All right. Uh, other questions on international trade generally? Yeah. So buying cheaper labor, oh, it's like having our cars in assembled in Japan is more beneficial, but isn't this also because labor here is more expensive because of the minimum wage? Um, the minimum wage, so we'll only spend a brief amount of time. How many of you guys have thought about the minimum wage before? All of you. All right. So is this like a high school debate topic or something? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, it's one of the first things people learn in economics, that you get supply, demand, you legislate a minimum price that's higher than what market clearing would be. You get unemployed people, right? So that's one thing that would encourage businesses to go elsewhere is if you mandate that they have to pay too much for the labor here. Uh, in fact, it's something we'll talk about a little in my next lecture when we go into sweatshops. You don't really see very much unemployment caused by the minimum wage in the United States. The reason's simple. It's mostly just a political show. They set it at something that would be below the market clearing rate for the vast majority of people in the United States. Uh, who it affects is basically people just a little bit older than you. Uh, late teenagers and people in their early 20s, particularly minorities, those are the ones who see the biggest unemployment effects of the minimum, minimum wage. But something on the order of 98% of the American population is, already makes more than the minimum wage anyway. So when you tinker with it of a 25 cents here or there, you don't see like big, massive changes. Not always true in US history. The first minimum wage came in in 1937, and it was set at, I believe, 25 cents an hour. And it's when average productivity in the United States, I think, was 62 and a half cents per hour. Note, by the way, 1937, that's the second part of the Great Depression, where after just a modest recovery, they start getting another dip. But they were pretty sloppy when they wrote the law. So not only did it create unemployment here in the United States, it applied to all the US territories. At the time, average productivity in Puerto Rico was about three to four cents an hour and you mandated a 25 cent minimum wage. Massive unemployment and business failure, so they have to go about changing the law. So when you do set it high, you get big unemployment effects, but for the most part, we don't see it because they just tinker with it below where it would affect most people. Yeah? Um, what about like healthcare and stuff? So like, for example, my dad, um, the companies have to pay a lot more to him because of um, healthcare and tons of taxes and such. So it's like 40% of all, or 60% of all his income is going to taxes and stuff. So our employers are paying for that. OK. What about it? As in, that's higher than, uh, instead of minimum wage being a problem for the businesses, all these red government regulations. Oh, listen, we could go through tons of regulations and things that are required in the United States that make it more expensive to employ, artificially more expensive to employ people, and that discourage business growth and formation. And for that matter, just uncertainty about how the government manages the macro economy and who's going to get bailed out next or whatever makes people, uh, actually it's another a senior economist here at Independent who calls it regime uncertainty of what's going to happen as they take their chips off the table. There's tons of that. Really not going to get into it all today. Yeah. Um, I heard that uh, the Australian minimum wage is ridiculously high, as in something around $25 per hour. Um, and I was wondering, is that cause it, I would expect lots of businesses to move out of Australia for that reason, as well as other reasons such as that? Well, for it to move out would want to see a change. So I don't know, I don't know if it's 25 bucks an hour. I s actually suspect it's not. Um, but if it's always been high like that, it wouldn't be like a new thing causing them to move. It would have come in and made its effect and made them, it might discourage more business growth or something like that. I can tell you the French case has a minimum wage uh, relative to productivity about twice as high as the United States and coupled with laws that make it difficult to fire workers once you hire them. And the result is very high double digit employment, unemployment among young people and has been for over a decade there. Um, so yeah, it does have real effects. So I'm not trivializing it. it just where it's played with in the United States, it just doesn't affect very many people. Uh, which is why when people are like, look, you don't see a big effect of it, it's like, well, yeah, because you're just messing around where it doesn't have much. If you had like a one cent minimum wage, it would unemploy nobody in the United States. At 8.25 an hour, what is it in California? 8.25, it touches some people, but not a whole lot. Oh, really? That's ridiculous. Yeah? But don't you think there are places in the world where labor is like $1 a day, right? Time out. Next lecture. Promise. Next lecture, we're talking about third world sweatshops and $1, $2 a day stuff all the time.
Yes. I have a question about um, international trade in regards to currency, particularly the gold standard. I heard an argument against the gold standard in regards to trade. It wasn't warranted at all, as usual, but um, they basically said that um, we should stay off the gold standard to keep our exports competitive. And I had no idea what that was referring to. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. Keeping our exports competitive means they want to keep the dollar artificially cheap so that foreigners can buy more of our goods. Um, so, but that would still not be a good reason for doing it because we don't want them to just buy more of our goods. Uh, I really don't think I want to get into a gold standard one today. I'll just give like a, the international gold standard was a pretty good system because it had an automatic adjustment mechanism when countries inflated too much gold would flow out, then they'd have to contract reserves. When they did so, gold would flow back in. It was an automatic stabilizer. It never failed. There wasn't like an international crisis of like gold standard failed. What happened was World War I. Governments wanted to inflate a lot during World War I. The gold standard would prevent them from doing it, so they all suspended the gold standard. Post-World War I, countries made an effort to go back to it, but they tried to go back at overvalued rates, and there was a problem with gold drain. Countries didn't want to abide by it, so they gave up on the system. It's because governments basically didn't like the fiscal responsibility it demanded of them. Um, and then what they do at the end of World War II is put a bread and wood system in, which tries to get the benefits of a fixed exchange rate of a gold standard without actually the discipline of the automatic correction. That's a system that breaks in the early 1970s, has given up, and now we're into the floating currencies we have today. Yeah? One question about uh, foreign currencies, like uh, foreign exchange currencies. Um, how exactly are uh, prices calculated for foreign exchange currencies? Since I know uh, currency itself is a product, but if uh, this product is created by a government, um, then are government setting the prices for them? Or are the people just selling them setting the prices for them? And how does the price system between foreign uh, currencies actually work? Is it more complicated than it sounds, or what's going on there? I think I can answer all of your questions simultaneously with a yes. <laughs> yes, it's more complicated. Yes, it's market forces. Yes, it's government pegs. It depends on the particular situations. So in general, it's supply and demand for the currencies, constrained by the fact that the government is the supply side. Mm -hmm. So they can manipulate the quantity. Then it's a question of demand for it, and then people's expectations of future inflation in various currencies that would determine the price. But then you get countries that have what we call a dirty float. So they'll let market forces do it, but the government's got an idea of what price they want for it and they'll try to intervene and buy up the currency to keep it at that price. Then you have ones that have a peg where they hold it at a particular price and the government buys or sells as much as necessary to maintain that peg. China's one country doing that. Other countries give up on it and just tie themselves to the dollar or a euro or another currency and say, so some Central American countries dollarize and say, our peso is going to be defined as so many dollars. And then they give up the freedom of their central bank and they just mirror whatever the US central bank does. So there's tons of different regimes, which makes things more confusing. Uh, all right, so let's get to the development part of this before we just get like on random issues. Um, so let's talk about this process that makes a poor nation become rich um, and the crucial role that entrepreneurs play in this. So entrepreneurs, uh, I don't know if Greg probably might have mentioned something about him in his earlier lecture on prices and competition. Um, they're responding to price, prices that they see in the economy where they think they can make a profit. They don't care about promoting economic growth. They care about getting rich for themselves. But if they're operating a market system, the only way they get rich for themselves is by serving other people better. So when we want to see places that are becoming wealthier, we want entrepreneurship to be working well. Basically, how many of you have traveled to poorer countries in the world, any poorer country in the world? A few of you. Where have you gone? Yes. Ecuador. Ecuador, that counts. Who are another? Where are the hands? Put them all up. Mexico. Mexico. That's it? All Mexico is in one Ecuador? Does Canada count? Does Canada count? No, it's the 51st state. What? <laughs> China, depending where in China, possibly. All right. When you were there, did you see any lack of entrepreneurship? Really? I don't know. I've been in lots of poor countries. I've never seen a lack of entrepreneurship. Quite the opposite sometimes. It's in your face, pain in the neck sometimes. Like I've been on a border crossing in between Kenya and Tanzania on a bus and like everyone's sticking their arms in the bus trying to sell me stuff. <laughs> they're entrepreneurs, but the amount of wealth they're able to create is very small. 
So it's not like some countries are rich because they have more entrepreneurs than others. Entrepreneurship's kind of everywhere. What differs greatly is how productive those entrepreneurs are. Do they do things that create great benefits for others, small benefits for others, no benefits for others, or make people worse off? And what type of environment then governs the system that directs the entrepreneurship into one of those four different ways? So the way to think of how entrepreneurship promotes growth in a healthy society is like, uh, how many of you have seen $50 bill laying on the sidewalk? You've never seen one, right? You found a $100 bill, actually. What did you do? Okay. Snatched it right up, right? So if any of these guys were walking 10 feet behind you, would they have seen a $100 bill on the sidewalk? Yeah. That's what entrepreneurship does in a healthy society. So in a healthy society, it's like $100 bills on the sidewalk. They pop up every now and then, but as soon as they do, someone grasps it. So in a healthy environment, entrepreneurial profit opportunities, entrepreneurs see them, seize them, make the world better off. And you get this kind of continual chugging of economic growth, 3 4% a year. Then, in countries that are, have bad institutions, it's like these $100 bills are popping up, but it's like there's a metal grate above the sidewalk, and you can't like reach down and pick the damn thing up. It's like, I could make people better off, except it was going to take me like three years and $20,000 of government permits and bureaucracy before I could actually create my business to get the profit up. So it's like the metal grate on the sidewalk. You just can't grasp these profit opportunities. And then what you see happen quite often is when a country improves their institutional environment, it's like that grate just dropped down lower. And all of a sudden, instead of like $100 bill being on the sidewalk, there's like bunches of them. And you see this like spurt of growth as everyone's grabbing up these things that should have just been churning along this whole time but weren't. So you kind of get this burst of growth. And then as it stabilizes, you just get into the regular kind of churning. This is a healthy process of economic development. For the most part, what we see in the world then is where do these $100 bills come from? other entrepreneurial acts. So not from people dropping them, from people seizing them, actually. So we've got to get away from our metaphor just a little bit here. But like, let's see, we're in Silicon Valley, so let's do something related to this. So Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel created, actually, and he was a board member here at the Independent Institute. I don't know if he still is. In fact, I got a picture on a slide pretty soon, I think. Um, he created PayPal. Was that just a $100 bill waiting on the sidewalk for him to collect? Why was he able to create PayPal? Because before that, someone created online merchandising on the web, right? Now there was a need for a PayPal. Before then, he could have thought up PayPal in 1990. Wouldn't have done a hell of a lot of good, right? But one entrepreneurial act, so let's say, let's take Steve Jobs who thinks there's a market for personal computers. He makes personal computers. Someone thinks there's a market for graphical interface. They create graphical interface. Someone thinks you can sell things. On, actually, somebody who probably deals in pornography thinks you can sell things online. That's basically how everything gets started on the internet. Then someone's like, oh, if they can sell that on the internet, I could probably sell books. And then, you know, there's eBay, and they're like, oh, we need a PayPal. What's, each one of these is like you're grabbing $100 bill. But by grabbing it, another one pops up somewhere else for someone to build on you. And this is kind of the churning process of where entrepreneurial opportunities come from, unless they're stifled. Uh, so entrepreneurship kind of drives the market forces to adjust for everybody so that we coordinate our activities. But in doing so, it creates new act opportunities that we'll have to adjust to in the future. So this, so that's Peter Thiel, by the way, who I mentioned. Productive, less productive, unproductive, destructive entrepreneurship are the things that we have to think about. So creating PayPal is productive. It made him very wealthy. In fact, actually, you might have seen him in a movie then, because after doing PayPal, uh, no, I don't know what Iron Man 2 is. <laughs> he made an appearance there. Did he? Yeah. Before uh, when uh, Tony Stark went to the race in Morocco. I'm not familiar with Tony Stark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Back to my story. <laughs> my story involved Facebook. Because of the money he made in creating PayPal, if you saw the movie Social Network, he was the financier who gave the money to start up Facebook. Very productive entrepreneur. He's made lots of people better off. As a result, he became wealthy in doing so. This is more like the entrepreneurship I described in crossing the border. There are people offering goods for sale, trinkets they made at home. If you buy it, it makes you better off. It makes them better off. But the scale of this is something much smaller than what Teal or other entrepreneurs in the United States have created. So it's productive. It's just less productive. The guy begging, that's unproductive entrepreneurship. I mean, it is entrepreneurial to know where to beg. 
Um, there's better and worse ways to do it. But in doing it, they might get some money, but they really don't make the world a better place. But they're not making it a worse place necessarily, it's just they're not contributing to other standard of living. But then the worst type is destructive entrepreneurship. So I've got a picture of a customs official down there. So if I want to make money and I'm selling, well, we'll stick with cars since it was our early example, and I'm selling Fords, I could try to make Ford a better car and as a result create more value for everybody. Another way I could try to make money is to get the government to put tariffs, taxes basically, on Japanese cars from, and stop them from coming in the country. Both ways I make more money. If I do this latter case, that's destructive entrepreneurship. I become wealthier, but I do it by making everybody else in society poorer. So entrepreneurs, for the most part, are largely indifferent as to which type of entrepreneurship they engage in. They care about which one makes them the most money. So what they do is dictated crucially by the, e the environment, the economic environment that they operate in. So the institutional environment that I think is crucial for productive entrepreneurship is one of economic freedom. So respecting people's private property rights, not taxing away their profits, not re regulating away their ability to engage in these profitable acts, not messing with the currency, because the currency, money, price signals, prices are information. Actually, if you remember nothing else from this seminar, even though I haven't like, focused on it entirely here, prices are conveyors of information. They tell you the relative scarcity of stuff. So entrepreneurs need to be able to read prices, one, to make a profit and not a loss, but two, to know how they can best serve society. Um, and then not eliminating the freedom to exchange, so your ability to trade with foreigners as well as domestic people. These are kind of what I'd call the core areas of economic freedom. And there's something that's published each year. It's called the Economic Freedom of the World Annual Report. It's kind of fun to get, actually. You should look it up online sometime. You can get it at uh, freetheworld.org. Um, and each year they rank. .com. Really? Freetheworld.com. Greg corrected me. Do both work? I bet you both work. OK, I'll check. Um, so each year they publish this report. Uh, interestingly, the United States used to rank pretty well, but has now fallen out of the top 10 for the first time. Uh, do you know who the freest country in the world is, by the way? Economically? Economically. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere that Ireland was, but, yeah. No, although I did a cool paper on Ireland and economic freedom one time. India? Not even close. No. But they've, been made, they've made big improvements. Nope. China? Nope. Not even close, but they made big improvements. You're good at picking the improvers. <laughs> no. Is it a European country? No. 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 Are we like going to play Africa. hotter cola here? Africa. <laughs> no. Oh, Africa's Africa. horrible. Antarctica. <laughs> they don't even have an economy. <laughs> All right. We're now into random guessings. Hong Kong. Hong Kong has been the freest economy ever since the index was created, and it dates back to 1970. Singapore has been the second freest for most of the time, illustrating that political freedoms aren't necessarily the same as economic freedoms. So you might get caned for spitting out your gum, but otherwise you're pretty free to engage in mutual beneficial exchange. Um, Ireland was higher in the rankings. They've slid back, but they made great strides in the 1990s. Um, so it's worth checking out online, by the way, to just check out and see what different countries are and how they've changed over time. Uh, so the relationship then between development and economic freedom. So this is breaking it up, the index, the Freedom Index ranks, I think, 140, 145 countries now. The most free ones, the second most free, the third most free, and then like the bottom 25%. So each one of these are 25%. 25% highest scores in freedom, per capita income up close to $30,000. As you go down in freedom, you see lower and lower levels of income. And it's not, so this is just the level of freedom that matters. What we actually found even more is that changes in freedom matter. So what you were picking out when you said China, India. China, I mean, think back, well, to three times your age. <laughs> uh, what was China like in the 1960s and 70s? Completely communist, as in also busily killing millions and millions of its own citizens. No economic freedom whatsoever, hard environment. Starting with Deng Xiaoping in the 1970s, late 1970s, 78, I think, um, they started making reforms towards the market. So in terms of economic freedom, if they were even ranked back then, which they weren't, it would have been hideous. But they've made big improvements. So over the last 30 years, they're the biggest improver in economic freedom in all of Asia. Part of what you see of China's growth right now is that big improvement in economic freedom. So it's analogous to back our sidewalk. 
that great, it might still have a big grade in China. They're about the, I'm going to say they rank around 75 in economic freedom or so. So that grade's still keeping them pretty far off the curb. But relative to where it was, it's been dropping like crazy. So tons of these entrepreneurial opportunities are popping up. And actually, even that index misrepresents China because China varies greatly as you go around different regions of it. Some, uh, a lot of the reform in China has come from the local level rather than the national level. So as a result, some regions are much, much freer than others. The overall one for the country kind of misstates it, and all the growth is occurring in those more free ones. Uh, India, same thing. They're the second biggest improver in Asia over the last 20 years in terms of increasing economic freedom. Uh, in terms of growth rates, similar relationships, clearly between the least free, very low growth, and the most free. A little bit of oddity in here. Some of what you see going on is exactly this fact, though, that China might be in the, th actually they are, in the third quartile. They're growing really fast, but they're making big improvements in freedom. It's just they haven't improved their level up that high yet. Um, how does this translate for the poor people in society? Most free, poor people live much better than the poor people in the least free countries. As an income share, that's the red line. It's not that they become more unequal. Their share of the income is about the same. It's just their absolute level is much higher when you have more economic freedom. So um, I'll spend just a minute on this. And then I want to talk about a couple of different countries maybe. Yeah? Isn't that last graph represent the uh, I have to look at the source. I'd assume so. Um, most of the time when economists will do international comparisons, they'll put it in purchasing power parity. But I pulled this from the economic freedom of the world report. I didn't calculate it myself. Okay. Um, so probably, but we can check it. All right. Uh, and in fact, I can tell you, the next lecture I did where I do the numbers myself are purchasing power parity, and I'll point it out when I'm doing them. Um, some people will say, so how many of you guys listen to U2? Do you still hear like U2? Only two of you, three of you? So what's Bono's big thing? <laughs> Not his big song. <laughs> but what's his big thing that he advocates for in public? The environment. Well, I guess he does all sorts of crazy things now. His big, his big thing has been world poverty. He wants to double aid to poor countries. So he's done his live aid concerts. And he's like, everybody text something, something to you know, double aid in your country or whatever. He's not telling you to donate your money. He's saying that taxpayers should have to donate more to third world countries. Um, he, incidentally. Unless it's Mick Jagger, just don't pay attention to economics from your singers. Uh, something about comparative advantage that they don't really know very much. Uh, Mick Jagger, on the other hand, is actually cool, because he went to London School of Economics, and he said Hayek was his favorite economist. He's pretty freaking cool. And it's in his songs, too. Like, can't get no satisfaction, can't always get what you want. He's got, like, trade-offs down. Um, any event, Bono's big thing, give more money to them. And I think this is a hard idea. Not solely, or not even principally, because it takes money away from people in the first world. The amount that we pay uh, of our taxes towards foreign aid is trivial. It's very small. The big problem is what it does to the countries who get it. We've got 60 years of development history of giving aid through the World Bank, some sense the IMF, USAID, host of other organizations, to countries with little to show for it. Over 400 billion poured into Africa in a 25-year time period. They had a negative per capita growth rate. It's not that they didn't grow very much. They got poorer. Where were the big success stories? If I ask you, who are the fastest growers in the last 20 years? What countries are you going to pick out? China. OK, India. China, India. Aid as a percent of their economy, trivial. How about the last 50 years? Who were the big growers after World War II? America. America? No. Sorry. Thanks for playing. Germany in their recovery. And they did have a bit of aid from the Marshall Plan, but that's a topic I could dig into another time. But how about Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea? Where is all the foreign aid there? Basically, the big success stories didn't have it. The places it's been poured in haven't grown. One of the reasons is what a famous economist, P.T. Bauer, called the politicaza politicalization of economic life. Basically, as more and more aid comes in, one, it takes away pressure for the rulers to reform, because now they have aid flows that they can use to buy off interest groups. But two, if you're an entrepreneur in a society, 
and let's say 30% of the income in your society comes through foreign aid, what do you do as an entrepreneur? You spend your effort trying to make sure that you get some of that aid coming in, right? But that's time you're spending seeking aid, but not seeking making other people's lives better. Basically, it distorts entrepreneurship. It pulls it away from the things that it could be doing in an advancing society and doing it to unproductive activities or sometimes destructive. Yeah? That'd be a motivational loss because they're, they're not motivated to work. So there's also the disincentive. If you're giving somebody aid, they might be less likely to be up by their own bootstraps. So there's certainly that aspect. There's other problems, too. One, you can't calculate how to optimally use it. So it is like just stuff falling into your economy, but you don't get the same price signals as you do in a market of which things should be created and which shouldn't. You've got plenty of what economists call rent-seeking or transfer-seeking. Uh, so that's this misdirecting of entrepreneurship. And it does a lot to keep bad people in power. Uh, I did an article one time here. It was uh, USA Today published a list of the 20 worst dictators in the world. And I had a, a student, a master's student, who was interning from me here. And I, we were joking. He said, do you know how many of them get foreign aid? I said, yeah, I bet you every one of them. And uh, well, so then I'm like, well, actually, why don't you look at that, that up and we'll write an article about it. And I was wrong. 19 of the 20 had <laughs> USAID money. All 20 of them had money from some of the OECD countries. Yeah? So um, in these uh, countries that are getting foreign aid with these uh, malicious dictators, uh, I'm guessing it's a large percentage of the money that just goes to the dictators and not to the actual people. So there's a lot that ends up in Swiss bank accounts, um, which actually, in my mind, is some of the best spent foreign aid, because at least it doesn't pervert the economy that's there. Um, when it actually ends up in their economy, it's bought off interest groups, bought off military threats, or uh, generally misdirected entrepreneurship. So actually, I think the best thing they could do is just steal it. Um, but this has been something that's been dragging down and misdirecting the entrepreneurship there. And in the end, then, not promoting economic freedom. So you need to get the environment of economic freedom in place. Uh, how are we doing these? Am I supposed to end lecturing at an hour or stop and just do general questions at some point before the hour? Um. However you want to do is, is fine. You have up until the hour before we, we take a little bit of a break before your next lecture. All right. So, so I'm not going to run through each of these points because I've basically already been talking about them. Um, the main one I've been talking about here is aid for investment of what we've been talking about. But they've run other aid programs that also fail. Aid for education. So you make people more educated, but yet you don't get growth. How come? Just intuitive, right? If they're smarter should be better off, right? Why doesn't it work? Because they don't have the like critical thinking skills that they need, like the uh, on-site. So some is what education do they get, right? Yeah. So when you have these corrupt governments who are distributing the aid through education, they don't educate them in things that will actually make them more productive. They educate them in ideology for the regime. That's part of it. But let's say they get critical thinking, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, the cool stuff. Yeah. Keeps the education prices up high because the uh, it's like the same issue that's going on here in America, where you get easy loans for education, and it keeps the prices up high for people who can't uh, actually get the aid. Yeah. I don't really think it happens very much like that in the poorer countries, yeah. just the way it's delivered. Because there's like a lot of just small private schools that operate on, you know, pennies per day, um, that just aren't involved in it. Yeah. Um, it it over-structuralizes or arbitrarily structuralizes education. And what I mean by that is kind of something that we do here in America, meaning we assume that everyone needs 12 years of school when really they don't. And we harm um, overall growth by saying, well, everyone needs equal levels of education. So when the academics could better be using their capital and time you know, to be more intensively trained, while the other people would much rather be working in practical levels of um, Yeah. So what is education is different depending on your level of economic development. Right, exactly. Learning how to plow might be more valuable than reading out of a book. Right. So it, it overgeneralizes and Cool. So is it that basically to be entrepreneurs or to have a productive life, someone may not need a doctor's degree in, a, in, a, you know, in Kenya? Or is it, is it kind of that too? So it could be what type of education is being delivered isn't the one that would help them better their lives the most right now. Mm -hmm. But I think we haven't got to the bigger problem. That's you're in a lousy institutional environment. So let's say you're in an environment where your property rights aren't secure. So if you start your business, the government just might come and take it from you, nationalize it. Or they might just inflate away your profits. Or they might regulate you to death. Now you get an education. Do you still make investments? 
No, hell, you're smart enough to know you shouldn't do that there, right? Or worse, now you're educated and you become part of the problem. <laughs> you become better at going to the government and getting them to harass and mess with other businesses that would compete with you. So basically, if you get your environment right, people will have the incentive to get an education. If the environment's wrong, just giving them education doesn't lead to the growth. Um, and actually, in one sense it does. If you've heard of brain drain, people get educated and leave their country. In a sense, though, that is economic development. Individual people have become better off. It's just a particular plot of land in it. Um, population control. So they'll say it's just too many people. We need fewer people in the country so that the given amount of production can be divided up among a smaller number of them. Usually they don't advocate actually killing people. They just want you to birth fewer of them. Um, problem with this is if you have good private property rights, people already have the incentive to have the right number of kids. The problem in some contexts are that they don't have good property rights, so you have open access to fields, streams, stuff like that, and then people overpopulate and deplete the resource. The answer has to be the property rights, not the population control. Because what they'll do is, so it's AIDS for birth control uh, that they'll give out basically, not for preventing AIDS, but for uh, reducing population growth. But if their incentives are still to have kids, they're going to have the kids. Giving them condoms does not do anything to change that situation. It's actually quite comical. I don't have it with me. I have a, a, a development aid condom uh, from when I was in Africa one time. Uh, a great big uh, blue UN plan your family dispenser was in the bathroom. And I had been uh, around to all sorts of little dirt hole bars in um, Tanzania, uh, places where everyone speaks Swahili, and I'm like the only white person in there. Uh, and uh, it's like had banana beer, like where they just like scoop it out of the trough on the stove and like you walk through dead animals to get it. It's pretty cool. I never saw one of these UN Plan Your Family dispensers anywhere. Then on my last night I stopped in Carnivore, this restaurant just outside the uh, Nairobi airport. Uh, at one time it was on the Zygot top 50 of the world list. It's like a Brazilian steakhouse but for African game meat. Uh, so it's very expensive. Tour buses like pull in there and drop people off to or fro the airport. The Africans who work there are quite wealthy. <laughs> The people who eat there are wealthy Westerners. What do I see when I walk into the bathroom? Great big blue UN plan your family dispenser. Makes no sense, right? Makes perfect sense. Who sees it? The wealthy Westerners who go there and think, oh, we must be doing something to help these poor people in Africa. Because they don't ever go to the dirt hole bars that I went to. They just go to this fancy one. So a lot of times the political incentives are just messed up in these programs too. You've been waiting, yes? OK, so um, also, doesn't every human born uh, account for a considerable increase in uh, capital because human capital is incredibly valuable? So I think, yes, I'm with Julian Simon that humans are the ultimate resource. Our creativity, our ingenuity is. So more people is more ideas. More ideas will make better use of other resources that we have around us. Uh, I do think it's the case, unfortunately, that when you're in some of these countries that have really messed up institutional environments, the amount of human creativity that can come out of someone is severely limited. Um, and that's part of a problem. All right, so let me just kind of fly through. We've talked about Africa a little bit. I will say that there's an exception there, uh, Botswana. Any of you heard of it before? A few of you. It was the fastest growing country in the world for about 30 years. Um, Semi-arid, British protectorate, landlocked in sub-Saharan Africa. They got their freedom from colonial rule, and what did they do? Eh, basically nothing. As a result, they grew. <laughs> so most of Africa, when it got its independence, rebelled against all things it viewed as colonial, including capitalism. And the intellectual fad of the day was socialism in the 1960s when they were getting their freedom. So they adopted horrible institutions. Botswana, because they were largely ignored by the British, they basically didn't care. <laughs> they got their freedom. They took a traditional clan elder, and they basically adopted a version of English common law and went about their business. As a result, they were the fastest growing country in the world for 30 years and really the biggest success story in all of Africa. Um, more recently, they found diamonds there. Uh, as a result, their government that was very limited has started growing in size, but they still rank quite well in economic freedom compared to the rest of Africa. Uh, so it's not like that the system of economic freedom and private property can't work for some people. It can work anywhere, even in Africa. It's just not tried very often there, Botswana being an exception. Uh, China, we've already talked about, so I'm not going to talk about it now as we're India is a similar story, except it goes to 1991, where they have a crisis. Uh, so this is actually a theme when you see change in countries. Often it's around a crisis. So crisis can make things much worse, or 
it's also just by its nature a break in the status quo, which gives you the opportunity for change. Some countries embrace that change in a positive direction. Uh, India being one of them in their 1991 crisis. Since then, they've improved their economic freedom by over 30%. For them, it's particular in freedom to trade internationally and international investment. Uh, telecommunications is another big one. Um, and their IT sector largely evolved after their big licensing regime, so it's been immune to it. Uh, as a result, that's where you've seen most of the growth in India. They still have all sorts of harmful regulations in, in farming, which is what most of the population subsists on still. And as a result, they're still in grinding poverty. Uh, someone mentioned Ireland before. So they're another example of a crisis for them in the mid-1980s, uh, where they made big improvements, uh, slashing government spending. So they took, so actually, so people talk about the Reagan revolution in the United States or the Thatcher revolution in England. When you actually look at how the country changed, though, there was a lot of talk. But in terms of concrete changes, it's hard to see much of a big improvement in economic freedom in the United States in the 1980s. What you see in Ireland is a dramatic change in the role of government. They went from government consuming about 55% of everything in the economy down to about 30%. That's a massive change of the role of government in the economy. And they did it in response to going bankrupt, basically. They had debt at over 100% of GDP, actually kind of like where the United States is headed now. Uh, and they tried inflating it. That didn't help. They had tried raising taxes. That wasn't enough to do it. They really were only left with either get an IMF loan and default or cut spending. They cut spending severely. Later on, they ended up cutting taxes to go with it. Um, so in the 1990s, they were growing at close to 10% a year for a number of years. After they got wealthier again, they started to retreat, actually, and they adopted more big government policies um, and have since had another crisis. And they're starting to make austerity measures right now. Um, so we'll see how this one turns out. So basically, punchline here. Economic freedom and private property rights are the essential environment to getting economic growth. Uh, improvements in those things can be as important as your absolute level. It's like dropping your grate on the sidewalk. Um, we have success stories in every corner of the world. There's no like culture that's immune to this. We can look at Chile and South America, Botswana and Africa, any number of countries in Asia. Um, so it's not something like unique that only the West can develop. The West happened to develop because they were the first one to stumble upon these institutions. It's not a matter of getting just technology. The technological know-how was probably far greater in ancient China than it was through much of the Middle Ages in Europe. But they never actually turned that into long-run economic growth. Um, it wasn't until we got that environment. We know a lot about what institutions cause prosperity. What I think we don't know, and this was economists and the general public and everybody, what we don't know very well is how do we get those beneficial institutions? How do you take a country that's poor and get them the right institutions to make them rich? Maybe that's something I can come back to at the end of my next lecture when we talk about sweatshops. So I think I'll leave it there. For this one, we've got like three minutes left if anyone's got questions as I was kind of like doing a whirlwind these last few minutes of jumping through countries. Yes? about Africa. Sure. Say uh, you manage to uh, get a reform in a country in Africa and then start um, industrializing it, uh, marketing off of cheap labor and everything. How quickly do you think it would become a, um, a well-developed nation? So economic development is a process, not a magic pill. So we can't just jump through it. The good news is the process happens much quicker than it used to. So think about. How long did it take the United States and Great Britain to go from pre-industrialization to, actually to foreshadow my next talk, to move beyond sweatshops? How long? About 150 years. Maybe as long as 150 in Britain. That's on the long side. But 100 to 150 years or so. It really wasn't until 19-teens, 1920s, that you really see it move beyond that. My great-grandmother worked in what would be a sweatshop what would be called a sweatshop, making shoes. It took so long because all the capital needed to be created anew. All the technology needed to be discovered. Actually, how we did it in the United States was we got a lot of investment from Great Britain, and we stole a lot of their technology. <laughs> but we were the first two countries going through it, so it all had to be created. Think about post-World War II. Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, they were all as poor as any poor country in the world today. 
they took about a generation and a half to go through the process. So that by the 1970s, they were first world countries. Now look at the growth that's happening in China and India today. As you make improvements and get that environment, it can happen much quicker now because there's all that technological know-how out there and the world's so much ri richer with capital that if you get it right, whoosh, flows in and it pushes the process much faster than it used to. So the answer for Africa then is the longer any nation stays behind and the rest of the world chugs on, the more explosive their potential is once they get it right. The problem is, how do we get them to get it right? And we have to be pretty modest about what, quote, we on the outside can do for them. All right, so with that, let's uh, wrap this one up, take your break, and uh, we'll be back in here in, what, 15 minutes, Kyle?